let's open. Dear Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be here today. And dear Lord, we thank you for this wondrous day. And dear Lord, we just thank you for who you are and what you do for us. And dear Lord, we're here and we hope that we take the message away to go and glorify your name. We ask that you open our hearts and our minds and our ears so that we might hear your word and apply it to our daily lives. But we ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. So our scripture lesson today comes from Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52, glorifying God. Now, the same lesson is also, or the same scripture is, or story, I should say, is actually found in Luke chapter 18, verses 35 through 43. Now, a little background to today's story, or today's scripture lesson, I should say. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem for the final time. Jesus was leaving Jericho, going up to Jerusalem, which is about an 18-mile walk. Jesus, as you remember earlier in Mark chapter 10, he blessed the children brought to him by their parents, even though the disciples scolded the parents. Then he encounters the rich man who comes to him and says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Then Jesus tells him what he must do. Does anyone remember what Jesus told him he must do? Sell everything. Do what? He had to sell all his possessions. He had to sell all his possessions, whatever. <laughs> Follow me. <laughs> but before that, he told him, he said, you must follow all the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone and you should honor your father and your mother. Teacher, he said, I have obeyed all of these commandments since I was young. Jesus then looked at him with genuine love and says, there is one thing you have not done. Sell all your possessions. <laughs> give the money to the poor and come and follow me. The man's face fell and he went away sad. Now, this story of the blind beggar is what is it is in three Gospels. The other Gospel it's in is in Matthew. Mark chapter 10, 46 through 52, Luke 18 through 35. They pretty much give an identical account of Jesus' encounter with Bartimaeus. However, Mark's Gospel gives a little more detail, telling that he is the son of Timaeus. And Mark is the only Gospel that calls the blind beggar by his name. Matthew's gospel, however, gives accounts of the two blind men sitting on the side of the road, and Jesus healed them both. So today we will see that the blind beggar had everything he needed and we need to glorify God. So let's read the scripture. Now the scripture lesson comes from Mark 10, chapter, four, uh, uh, chapter 10, verse 46 through 52. They came to Jericho, and he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho. Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart. Get up, he's calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, my teacher, let me see again. <clears throat> Jesus said to him, go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. It is common in those days, much like today, for beggars to be on the side of the road or lining the side of the road, asking people passing by to give them food or money. Bartimaeus had positioned himself well, and as it was leading up to the Passover season, many of the Jews were on their way to Jerusalem. Now, the Jews avoided Samaria, so the most natural path for them to go through was Jericho. It was also pious thing for a godly Jew to give alms to the poor. Bartimaeus was well positioned for the opportunity that was about to come his way. When Bartimaeus heard that, uh, that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, the scripture tells us he began to shout. Bartimaeus, primarily a male name of Greek origin that means honorable son or son of the honored one. But as we can see, he was anything but. He was blind, he was a beggar, he did not bring his family fame or fortune. He actually probably brought them shame. But as we can and will see, 
He did not let that keep him from Christ. So he, Bartimaeus, begins to shout and called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, despite his condition and circumstance, he called out to Jesus. Bartimaeus had probably heard of Jesus' miracles, and especially the miracle in John 9, where Jesus healed the man who was blind since birth. Maybe he had heard of all the miracles and healings, or maybe he had heard of all his teachings. But something drew him to Jesus and made him want to call out to him. So much that he even called him by his messianic title, Jesus, son of David. This time, Jesus did not refuse the public acclamation as Messiah. He just wanted, did Bartimaeus just want alms or did did he have faith in Jesus that had led him to believe in Jesus and that Jesus could restore his sight? We see this typically have mercy on me for the afflicted people throughout the Bible, especially in the Psalms, Psalms 4, 6, 9, 25, and on and on throughout the Psalms. This is a cry of a penitent heart. Bartimaeus is glorifying God as he knows his plight and he cannot remedy. So he cries out to Jesus, the only one who can remedy. Be quiet, many of the people yelled at him, much like when the disciples scolded the parents for bringing their children to Jesus earlier in chapter 10. The crowd shouted or showed a lack of respect and a feeling of dislike for the beggar. They considered Bartimaeus lowly and despised. Their opposition to the blind beggar seeking Christ shows us what class? That the devil is at work even in this type of situation. One would say the crowd rebuking the blind beggar were the ones who were really blind. But Bartimaeus was undeterred. He is not about to let anybody or anything stop him from getting to Christ, and neither should we. We should be like Bartimaeus and never let our circumstance, other people, or our embarrassment keep us from calling out to Christ. So what he what does he do? Bartimaeus cries out even louder. Son of David, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. This is the second time the messianic title is recorded by both Mark and Luke. So he glorified God or Jesus again. Jesus, knowing he is going to his death, accepts the title once again openly. He has avoided it, as you know, much through the scriptures because of the wrong political and worldly ideas the Jews connected with the Messiah or the king they were expecting. Jesus did not fit the bill of that Messiah that the Jews were expecting. <clears throat> then Jesus stood still and said, call him here. So whatever Jesus was doing, he stopped. I think here we all see that Jesus displays his mercy, his grace, and his compassion. We see it here. All the people have treated the blind beggar as a lowly and, and insignificant, but Jesus displays his glory by stopping and acknowledging the lowly blind beggar with his undivided attention. Jesus decides all of the people in, of all of the people in this crowd, much like he did with the sinners, the tax collectors, the lepers, that he is going to spend some time with this blind beggar. But why should we be amazed or anyone else be amazed that, we're, that, that was there? He's done this through all throughout the Gospels. Then the things and the tone changed for those who had previously rebuked the blind beggar. Much like kids who are arguing, then the parent walks in, or two VPs arguing over who's going to get the better office. Then the CEO walks in. A person of authority walks in, and they make the call that is fair and just, hopefully. <laughs> they called the blind man saying, take heart, get up. He is calling you. Then the scripture says, so throwing off his cloak, he sprung up and came to Jesus. What do you suppose the throwing off of the cloak <clears throat> is simple? He wanted to get there in a hurry. Okay. <laughs> he did. He did. Take what else? Off hat and show him respect. Show him respect. What else? Well, the cloak was worn by beggars in those days because it, they would spread it out in order to collect alms. Bartimaeus depended on it for his livelihood. 
it was probably very important to him. But he was willing to cast it aside to give up and give it up in order to meet Jesus. He was casting away his own self-efforts. It could also symbolize sin in his life. And he was freeing himself from that sin. And he was going to meet Jesus without guilt and knowing that he was forgiven. Also notice he did not say, can you give me a hand or help me up? No, he was enthusiastic and joyful about the opportunity to meet Jesus. He sprung up and came to Jesus. Isn't that the way we should be? His enthusiasm, I think, glorified God as well. Then Jesus said to Bartimaeus, not what's up, what do you need? How can I help you? What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? Now, there are certain things we need to have done for us that we are incapable of doing for ourselves. I think God does a lot for us, helps us a lot, does for us that we cannot do for ourselves. Mark Demas was blind and nothing he could do about it. We have needs that we cannot meet for ourselves. We need to be forgiven of sins. We are in need of spiritual direction. We are in need of guidance. Maybe there is something we want to do, but we don't feel we're capable of doing it. Or maybe we have a disease that is incurable or debilitating. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ is very able and perfectly willing to do these things for us. To meet these needs, we are incapable of meeting. If it is his will, he will meet that need. And he may meet it and may meet that need in a way that is better than we ever thought. Whether or not we whether or not our need is met depends on one thing, our willingness to receive what God and Jesus offer us. We, like Bartimaeus, have to receive what he gives, and what we receive it, we have to receive it through faith and with a joyful heart. Then Bartimaeus says to Jesus, glorifying him again, he says, My teacher. Let me see again. Let me see again indicates that maybe Bartimaeus was not always blind. Maybe he had a disease that had caused his blindness, or maybe he had had an accident. So we don't know how or when he actually became blind. The scriptures really do not tell us. But do you think maybe he wanted to see the world? He wanted to see the beautiful creation of God. He wanted to see people again. Maybe he wanted to see those that he had begged from. Maybe he wanted to just see himself. Or maybe he just really wanted to see Christ, who he believed in with all his heart. It reminds us of the words of the great hymn, Amazing Grace. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. And what does Jesus say to him? He said, go. Your faith has made you well. Your faith the assurance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. This is the true meaning of Ephesians 2 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. As you see, G Jesus demonstrated his glory and grace by restoring Bartimaeus' sight. And Bartimaeus, in turn, glorified him by confirming his changed heart and validated his faith in God by what he does next. Now, in Luke's gospel, he tells us instantly the man could see and he followed Jesus, praising God, and all who saw it praised God, too. So Bartimaeus may have been blind, but he could see with his spiritual sight, and others could not see because of their spiritual, what others could not see because of their spiritual blindness. Now he had both physical and spiritual sight, and he praised God for it. And the, and through Jesus demonstrating his glory, other hearts were also changed, the scripture says, that day. They who were spiritually blind that day had their spiritual blindness healed. This blind man was marginalized by society, became a powerful witness for Jesus after his encounter with him. So there are some things that Bartimaeus did that we can do too that can help us glorify God. What's the first thing? He did in the first part of the scriptures. He heard. He heard the crowd. And he said, what, who is it? What is it? And they said, it's Jesus passing by. 
Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth. When the crowd was passing by, he asked what it meant. We too can read and have, have the word and through prayer and fellowship can ask what it means in our faith walk. Next, he cried out. He cried out saying, Jesus, the son of David, have mercy on me. Like the tax collector in Luke 18, 9. Remember the parable Jesus told of the Pharisee and the tax collector? And the Pharisee prayed about how he was not a sinner and he didn't want to be like the tax collector. But the tax collector humbly asked, barely being able to lift his eyes up to heaven and ask God for mercy, for he was a sinner. Not a bad way to start our prayers, humbly and with thanksgiving, asking for mercy. He came. Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought to him. Now, we too can go to Jesus with our joys, our trials, and our cares. He welcomes us just as he welcomed Bartimaeus. He wants us to come with joy no matter our circumstance. <clears throat> Next, he spoke, saying, what do you want me to do for you? We too, through prayer and meditation, can ask. Of course, God knows what we need before we even ask. The scriptures tell us that we can still ask or tell him what we need. He received. Jesus said, go, your faith has made you well. We too can humbly accept Jesus' grace and salvation through our faith with a changed heart. And then he followed him. Immediately, he, immediately he received his sight and followed him. We too can choose to follow Christ and praise him for all he has done, no matter what others may say or try to discourage us. And lastly, he glorified God. He followed him, glorifying God with all the other people when they saw that, that saw it glorified and they gave praise to God as well. We should glorify God in all, in all we say and do, the scriptures tell us. We can be a witness to and about God's glory in our lives. So today in closing, I want to tell you a story about another person who was blind and who certainly glorified and changed the hearts and brought a lot of people to Christ through her music. Anyone want to guess who it was? We sang one of her songs earlier. Francis Jane Crosby wrote more than 9,000 hymns, mm -hmm. some of which are among the most popular in every Christian denomination. She wrote so many that she was forced to use pen names. Who won? Oh, song. Yeah. Come on, man. I thought you, I thought you were going to say it. No, I thought you were going to say it. No, I thought you were going to say it. I was going to give it before. Hey, who want the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yeah. yeah. She wrote so many that she was forced to use pen names lest the hymnals be filled with her name above all others. And for the most, and for most people, the most remarkable thing, her, thing about her was that she was, she did all this despite her blindness. As she was born in Putnam County, New York, Crosby became ill within two months. Unfortunately, the family doctor was away and another man pretending to be a certified doctor treated her by prescribing hot mustard pouches to be applied to her eyes. I apologize, I don't know the pronunciation of that. I should have worked a little harder Vic. When the doctor was revealed to be a quack, he disappeared. A few months later, Crosby's father died. Her mother was forced to find work as a maid to support the family, and Fanny was mostly raised by her Christian grandmother. <clears throat> her love of poetry began at an early age. Her first verse, written at age eight, echoed her lifelong refusal to feel sorry for herself. And it goes like this. Oh, what a happy soul I am, although I cannot see. I am resolved that in this world content I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. To weep and sigh because I'm blind, I cannot and I won't. While she enjoyed her poetry, she zealously memorized the Bible as well, memorizing five chapters a week. Even as a child, she could recite the Gospels, the Proverbs, the Songs of Solomon, and many Psalms, chapter and verse. <coughs> Her mother's hard work paid off. Shortly before her 15th birthday, Crosby was sent to a recently founded New York Institute for the Blind, which would be her home for 23 years, 12 as a student, 11 as a teacher. 
She initially indulged in her own poetry and was called upon to pen verses for various occasions. In time, the principal asked her to avoid such distractions in favor of general instruction. We have no right to be vain in the presence of our owner and creator of all things, he said. Didn't take long, by age 23, Crosby was addressing Congress and making friendship, friendships with presidents. In fact, she knew all the chief executives of her lifetime, especially Grover Cleveland, who served as secretary for the Institute for the Blind before his election. Another member of the Institute, former pupil Alexander Van Austin, married Crosby in 1858, considered one of New York's best organists. He wrote the music to many of Crosby's hymns. Crosby herself put music <coughs> to only a few of hers, though she played harp, piano, guitar, and other instruments. More often, musicians came to her for lyrics. For example, one day, musician William Doan dropped by her home for a surprise visit, begging her to put some words to a tune he had recently written, which he was to perform at an upcoming, upcoming Sunday school convention. The only problem was that his train was going to leave in 35 minutes. He <laughs> sat at the piano and played the tune. Your music says, safe in the arms of Jesus, Crosby said, scribbling out the hymn's words immediately. Read it on the train and hurry. You don't want to be late. The hymn became one of Crosby's most famous. I think it's a great pity, the master said. The school, you know, I think it's a great pity that the master did not give you sight when he showered you so many other gifts upon you, remarked one well-meaning preacher. Fanny Crosby responded at once, as she heard such comments before. Do you know that if at birth I had been made, had been able to make one petition, it would have been that I was born blind, said the poet, who had been able to see only for her first six weeks of life. Because when I get to heaven, the first face that I shall ever be glad in in my sight will be that of my Savior. God be the glory. Amen. Everyone have a great week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.